Hello, everybody. Welcome back to my channel, and thank you for joining me for another true crime video. And today we're talking about a notorious case out of Texas, a case whose victims are known as the Fort Worth Trio. Three girls, all under the age of 18, who went Christmas shopping at the mall and then vanished into thin air, never to be seen again. And this case has remained unsolved for almost 50 years, and I had personally never even heard of it before, even though objectively, it is one of Fort Worth's most well-known cold cases. I actually stumbled upon it while I was going through old newspaper articles for a case that Derek and I are doing for Crime Weekly, and the case that we're doing on Crime Weekly centers around another Fort Worth teenager who encountered foul play. And there is a possibility that these two cases may be connected, the Fort Worth trio, and then the case that Derek and I are talking about on Crime Weekly, which is Carla Walker. Now, at first, the disappearance of these three girls may seem straightforward, simply because there was so little evidence. It actually was as if they'd been there one minute and gone the next. But as we get deeper and reveal some of the relationships and dynamics among the girls who disappeared and their families, their loved ones, their friends, the waters certainly become muddied. So we're gonna talk about all of that today it's very intense. It's a very intense case. But first, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Incogni. Privacy is so important to me because so much of my life is out there on the internet, but I want to make sure there isn't too much out there because I want to protect myself and my family. And it's really hard to control that yourself. It's really hard to find that balance all alone because I'm just one person. And every day, thousands of companies are collecting, aggregating, and trading your personal data without you knowing anything about it. And I'm not just talking about, you know, your full name, your email address, your phone numbers. I'm I'm talking serious things, things that can compromise you, like social security numbers, IP information, employment history, even your shopping habits. And it's scary to think about what someone could do with all of that information. And if these companies are only selling your data, that's the least of what they can do with it. Now, I don't want to give anyone that kind of access to me, my life, my family, or that kind of power to mess with my life. And don't even get me started on what happens if any of those companies have a data breach. For instance, PayPal is just one of the latest companies to report a massive data breach. And when these things happen, you don't even find out about it until the company notifies you. And by then, all of your information, including credit card numbers, banking info, social security numbers, they're all out there. They're all up for sale on the dark web. It's truly terrifying. And I know for someone like me, who likes to kind of be in control of things, it gives you a powerless feeling. You do have the right to request data brokers to delete what information they have about you and to protect your privacy. The bad news is though, alone, by yourself, just one person, it would take you years to do it manually and that is where Incogni comes in. Incogni can do all that long, messy work for you automatically. Incogni helps you protect your privacy and take your personal data off the market by reaching out to data brokers on your behalf and requesting that your personal data be removed, and then they also deal with any objections. Now, I have had issues in the past with identity theft, uh, really bad issues years ago. Someone once opened up multiple lines of credit in my name, and it took actual years to fix everything. I still think it's kind of like on the tail end of it. It's been a nightmare, and I don't ever want to go through that again, and honestly, I don't want any to go through that. And that is why I use Incogni for myself. And I suggest that anyone else who doesn't have the time to take care of this stuff, but really wants it done also use Incogni. And the Incogni setup process is so easy. You just sign up with your email address and then a number will pop up on the screen. This is number is going to show you how many data brokers Incogni has on its list ready to be contacted, which I love because it's a real intangible number that makes me feel like something's already being done. You know, I can see the amount of data brokers that have my information. And now, I'm one step closer to being safe on the internet and I have access to information which makes me feel more in control. I love that Incogni is easy to use. It's streamlined. There isn't a bunch of clutter on their interface. I hate that because my brain can't stand it. And it just tells me what I need to know so I can move on with my day. There's not a lot of tabs. There's not a lot of buttons. It's like straightforward. It's simple. It's helpful. It's productive. And then as time goes on, Incogni also keeps you updated on what's happening. For instance, for me, after a few weeks, I was notified that not 
2009, data brokers had already deleted my data, and I was able to clearly see that in the Incogni dashboard. I definitely think that you should try Incogni out for yourself because everyone can benefit from this service. And right now, I have a great deal for you because the first 100 people to click the link in the description box below and to use code Stephanie Harlow will get 60% off at Incogni. Start getting your private information wiped from the internet right now by clicking the link below or going to incogni.com slash Stephanie Harlow and use code Stephanie Harlow for 60% off at Incogni. Thank you so much to Incogni for sponsoring today's video and let's dive in. Fort Worth in the 1970s was a big city with a small town feel, a place where people were friendly, a place of community, family ties, a place where people felt comfortable leaving their doors unlocked at night. When I'm walking down the street with friends of mine from other places and I say hello and somebody says hello back and they'll say, who was that? I said, I don't know. I said, but you just spoke to him and he spoke to you. I said, That's Fort Worth. But I will admit, it doesn't take much digging to realize that beneath the glossy all-American patina, something very dark was going on in Fort Worth during the 1970s. And I discovered this as I was going through the Carla Walker case, because as I said in the intro, I use newspapers.com. And when you're looking at, you know, articles for one case, you see the whole page of the newspaper and it shows you all these other articles. And as I was going through, I was like, wow, there's a lot of crime happening in Fort Worth at this time, you know, like 1973, 74, 75 period. In fact, it seemed like crime sort of started having an uptick in Fort Worth around 1972 and then just continued on, right? For instance, disappearances of young women in the area began in the 70s and peaked in 1984 with bodies turning up all over Fort Worth, leading law enforcement to believe that one or more serial killers may have been using the city as their hunting grounds. And killers like Kenneth Granville and Samuel Little, who were later apprehended, they admitted that they had used Fort Worth as their hunting grounds, right? We know that that was a fact. And there is the still unsolved Fort Worth mansion murders. Once again, another riveting case that I had never heard about. If you want me to cover that one, let me know in the comments. And then we have the case of the Fort Worth Trio. The Fort Worth Trio refers to 17-year-old Mary Rachel Trelisa, who went by her middle name, Rachel, 14-year-old Lisa Renee Wilson, who, strangely enough, also went by her middle name, Renee, and 9-year-old Julie Ann Mosley, who seems to have just gone by her first name, Julie. These three girls would go to the Seminary South Shopping Mall in Fort Worth around noon on December 23, 1974. They'd planned to be back by 4 p.m., but when they didn't return by that time, their family members went to the mall looking for them. They didn't find the girls, but they did find Rachel's car parked in the upper level lot behind the Sears Automotive Center. Some articles, not from the time, not from 1974, but from around the 1990s and on, refer to this parking lot as the employee parking lot. So I'm just going to throw that in there because it wasn't called that in 1974 when this was being reported on, but it was referred to as that later. And there is some sightings of the girls with a man who may have been a mall employee. So it's kind of important to just keep in our notes and keep in the back of our minds. And that was all the family members found, right? Rachel's car in that Sears parking lot. And this was a frustrating situation, which was expressed many times by members of the Fort Worth Police Department, with one detective stating, quote, we just can't get any farther than that parking lot, end quote. Basically, they were saying every lead that they had brought them right back to the parking lot. They couldn't place these three girls leaving that parking lot at any time. There was no evidence that they had. There was nothing to show the police that uh, Rachel, Renee, and Julie had left with anybody, left of their own free will, nothing. It was literally as if they had been there one second and gone the next. They vanished in thin air. So Rachel, in 1974, she's married to a man named Tommy Trelisa. 
Rachel's maiden name was Arnold. And Rachel and Renee were both students at Southwest High School in Fort Worth, Texas. And before she'd gotten married and moved out of her family home, Rachel had lived just a few blocks away from Renee in the middle class South Fort Worth neighborhood of Greenbrier. And even though Renee was two grades behind Rachel, the girls had become good friends and even their families were close. The families would hunt and fish together when the weather was nice, so they knew each other very well. Now, when Rachel had gotten married, she'd moved into a house with her husband just a few minutes away from her childhood home, which allowed her friendship with Renee to continue as usual. And let's talk for a moment about Rachel being married, because as I said, she was only 17 and she was still a senior in high school. And although I do know and I understand and admit it was a different time, the 1970s, people got married a little bit younger back then, sometimes In my opinion, even for 1974, 17 still seems very young to be married, especially since she hadn't even graduated from high school yet, right? So there, there's already something that's a little bit strange and stands out about Rachel. And Rachel had married 22-year-old Thomas Trelisa, who she and everyone else referred to as Tommy. Now, in December of 1974, when Rachel went missing, she and Tommy had been married for just six months. And reportedly, she had found out kind of last minute on December 23rd that her husband's two-year-old son, Sean, from a previous marriage, would be spending Christmas with them that year. So she'd already purchased Sean a present, which was wrapped and in her car, but knowing that the child would now be waking up with them on Christmas morning, Rachel wanted to go to the mall and get some more presents so that when Sean got out of bed, he would see, you know, multiple presents under the Christmas tree and she could give him a good Christmas morning. Now, Rachel had originally asked her 19-year-old sister, Deborah, if she wanted to go to the mall with her. Deborah had recently broken up with her boyfriend and had moved in temporarily with Rachel and Tommy, but the three of them had allegedly been up until four o'clock in the morning the previous night playing Canasta, which is a card game for those of you who don't know. And Deborah said she was too tired to get out of bed. She wanted to just sort of sleep in. So Rachel called her close friend Renee and asked if she wanted to take a trip to the mall that day. Now that morning, Renee was actually at her grandmother's house. She had spent the night the night before, and Renee would usually stay on the weekends with her grandmother while her mother worked at the local dry cleaners. Across the street from Renee's grandmother lived the Mosleys, which included single mother Rayanne, who was separated from her husband, and Rayanne's three children, 16-year-old Terry, 11-year-old Janet, and 9-year-old Julie. Renee agreed to go to the mall with Rachel, and she was actually with Terry Mosley at that point because she and Terry had been going steady for a while, and that morning they were exchanging Christmas gifts, and Terry had come over, to Renee's grandmother's house to give her her gift. And he'd actually brought his little sister, nine-year-old Julie. And Terry's gift to Renee that day would be a promise ring, which she allowed him to slip on her finger before asking if he wanted to join herself and Rachel at the mall. Terry said he would, but he'd already made plans to visit with a friend that day who was having a an operation in the hospital. And Terry thought it would be kind of rude to back out when he promised he would be visiting with him. And so Terry said, you know, you guys go and do your thing. I have to go and visit a friend, but Terry did remind Renee that they were attending a Christmas party that night. While the young couple chatted, Terry's little sister Julie was eavesdropping, as little sisters do, and she begged to be allowed to go to the mall with Rachel and Renee. Renee said she didn't mind, but Julie had to get permission from her mother, who was at work. Rayanne Mosley received a call that morning from her nine-year-old daughter begging to be allowed to go to the mall with the older girls. And at first, Rayanne was nervous and she didn't think it was a good idea. She said, quote, I remember that Julie called and wanted to go to South Seminary. I said, no, you don't have money. You just stay home. I knew Renee and her mother, but I really didn't know Rachel. But she kept whining about how she wouldn't have anyone to play with. I finally gave in, but I told her to be home by six. End quote. And that timeline wouldn't be a problem because Renee wanted to be home by four anyways, so she would have plenty of time to get ready for the Christmas party that she was attending with her boyfriend, Terry. It was reportedly around noon when Rachel Trelisa pulled up in her 1972 Oldsmobile Cutlass to pick up Julie and Renee, but they didn't go straight to the mall. 
first, they stopped at a surplus store located at 601 West Berry in Fort Worth so that Renee could purchase two pairs of jeans that she'd had on layaway there. Before leaving the store, Renee changed out of the jeans she'd been wearing and put on one of her new pairs. From there, it is believed that the three girls headed to the mall, which, by the way, is no longer called Seminary South, but I guess it's now known as Fort Worth Town Center. If you live in the area, let me know if that's correct, because I found like three separate names that South Seminary Mall had turned into, and I don't think it matters that much, but... I do like to be accurate. Now, I say it's believed that they went to the mall because that's where Rachel's car would later be found. And also, allegedly, several witnesses claim to have seen the three girls inside the shopping center, specifically remembering this unique pal yellow t-shirt that Renee was wearing. And this t-shirt had the words, sweet honesty, embroidered on the front. But that was the last time they would be seen, and even those sightings can't be believed 100%, honestly, in my opinion, because eyewitness sightings are notoriously unreliable, and they never really specified who these people were that saw this or where they saw the girls, like what part of the mall they saw the girls in, what were the girls doing, were they with anybody? Now, there is one eyewitness who's going to come forward later who claims that he saw the girls with somebody, but once again, there wasn't a lot of detail that was connected to these eyewitness sightings, at least not that the public got, which you would think by now, almost 50 years later, we would have that information because at this point, clearly the Fort Worth police cannot solve this case. And you should maybe be a little bit more open with the details. But when the girls didn't return home by 4 p.m. or 5 p.m., several of their parents became concerned. I mean, all of their parents. And the parents went to the mall to locate them. And it was actually Rachel's mother who was kind of on the scene first. And she found Rachel's car on the upper parking lot behind Sears. It was locked. Everything seemed to be normal, but Rachel, Renee, and Julie were nowhere to be found. Now, Rachel's little brother, Rusty, who he's going to become an integral part of this case as well, but he was just 11 at the time. He remembered going into the mall with his mother, and he said they went from store to store. They looked for the girls everywhere. They had them paged. They talked to every employee, and they did this until one by one, the lights in each store began to go out, and then the lights in the hallways began to go out, and this signaled that the mall was closing. And Rusty remembered that as they left the mall defeated that night at around 11 p.m., he personally wasn't feeling too concerned because he was used to having a sister who was a little bit rebellious and wild. But it wasn't usually Rachel pulling stunts like this. It was usually his eldest sister, Deborah. Rusty had grown up watching Deborah pull stunt after stunt and generally just act like a troublemaker, and this included running away from home quite often. Sometimes Deborah would be gone for days or weeks, but she always returned until one day she didn't come back, and neither did Rachel. They both kind of moved out, moved in with boyfriends, um, just basically wanted to get away from home. And there may have been a reason why both sisters wanted out of that home, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Notably, the Fort Worth Police Department also didn't seem too concerned that the three missing girls had encountered trouble. They assumed it was more likely that Rachel, Renee, and Julie had run off somewhere, and they'd be back when they ran out of money or things to do or both. And when the police were able to get into Rachel's car in the parking lot, they didn't find anything suspicious in there. In the back seat, they found that wrapped present for Rachel's stepson, two-year-old Sean, but this present had already been there since before the mall trip. And they also found two pairs of jeans. This was normal because we know that Renee had picked these up from the surplus store that day. One pair was the older pair of jeans that she'd already owned. And the other pair was one of the new pairs she bought. And this adds up with what we know about the timeline, which is Renee bought these two pairs of jeans, took off her old pair, put on one of the new pairs, and you'd expect that she would leave the other two pairs of jeans that she wasn't wearing in the car, which is exactly where they were found. Fort Worth detectives brought Rachel's husband, Tommy, to the parking lot and to the car, and they asked him to look around and let them know if anything seemed out of place or if anything was missing. And Tommy said that everything seemed normal besides a few items that he noticed were missing from the glove compartment. And these items were three $50 bonds that he claimed he had purchased with his first wife, Sean's mother, as well as a copy of his parents' will. Now, Tommy's parents had sadly both passed away recently, within a year of each other from natural causes, but he'd been left without any parents. What he was left from his parents was that car 
that Rachel was driving. So Tommy claims that these items are missing. However, he did tell the police that even though he knew the bonds and the will were no longer in the glove compartment of this vehicle, he said he couldn't be sure how long they'd been missing or even if he had removed them himself which I think is kind of odd because if you say that they're missing, you should remember whether it was you who made them missing, but that's just my opinion, don't come for me. So no one could find Rachel, Renee, or Julie that night. They didn't hear from them, they didn't come home, and as the hours ticked by and everything got really stressful and everyone got really worried, three men went to the area where Rachel's car was parked at the mall and they kind of like staked it out all night. And these three men were the three fathers of the girls who were missing. And they sat there with a shotgun watching Rachel's car in case the three girls returned or in case someone decided to come back to the scene of the crime. And as I said, the police were operating on the initial theory that Rachel, Renee, and Julie were just off on a whim, even though Rachel's car had been left behind. And why would they have left a perfectly good getaway car behind if all they wanted to do was take off for a bit and blow off some steam? Remember, this is the 70s, the early 70s. Cars didn't have GPS. There weren't surveillance cameras on every stoplight and every building. There weren't license plate readers or toll booth records on the highways. If the three girls had run away with that car, it's not like having the car would have made them easier to find. So why would they have left it behind? Now, of course, you can argue that maybe Rachel left it behind because it was Tommy's car and maybe they shared this vehicle so she didn't want to leave him stranded without a vehicle. However, Tommy owned a transmission shop. That was his job. That was where he was working that day when Rachel decided to go shopping with Renee and Julie. Reportedly, what's been found from records is that this transmission shop was initially owned by Rachel's father, Cotton, and Cotton sold this transmission shop to Tommy for $10,000 the summer that Tommy married Rachel. So it did seem kind of like the business was passed on, the family business was passed on, and this may have happened because Rachel's father, Cotton, was terminally ill. He had stage four cancer and he was dying. So he passed it on to Tommy and that's where Tommy worked. So Tommy would have access to different vehicles through that transmission shop if Rachel was going to run away and escape for a little bit you know, she may not have cared whether or not he had a vehicle, knowing that he could have just picked one from the shop if he really needed to get somewhere. And I mean, he must have had access to another vehicle because he went to work that day. He was able to get to work that day, and I believe he had a bowling league that night that he went to, which is where he was when the police called him and let him know that his wife was missing. And then he managed to get to the Sears parking lot as well to look at Rachel's car. So he must have had access to another vehicle somehow, somewhere. So yeah, the police said they probably just ran away. Don't worry, they'll be back. And once again, this does seem kind of callous to us, but it was the 70s. And it was a time where I do believe there was a lot of crime happening, but people weren't as aware of it. It wasn't playing in the 24-7 news cycle every time something happened. We didn't have to hear about it repeatedly. And I think that a lot of people probably turned a blind eye to it. And you didn't really have a ton of, you know, teenagers just being snatched off the street. It was just more likely for their age for the situation that they had run away. At least that's what the Fort Worth police believed, even though the parents of these three girls stated right from the beginning that it couldn't have possibly been the truth. Now, this runaway theory, though, it was only bolstered the following day, Christmas Eve, when Rachel's husband, Tommy Trelisa, and Rachel's sister, Deborah, showed the police a letter that had been found in their mailbox that morning. Rachel's name was written in pencil on the upper left-hand corner of that envelope, and the envelope was addressed to a Thomas A. Trelisa. The letter inside was written in ballpoint pen, and it said, quote, I know I'm going to catch it, but we just had to get away. We're going to Houston. See you in about a week. The car is in Sears Upper Lot. Love, Rachel. End quote. So this letter is huge, right? The puzzle pieces of where Rachel, Renee, and Julie were seem to be falling into place. They just had to get away, so they'd taken off to Houston for a few days. But did that really make sense? The girl, 17-year-old Rachel Trelisa, the former Mary Rachel Arnold, 14-year-old Renee Wilson and 9-year-old Julie Ann Mosley vanished December 23rd after telling their families they were going shopping. Their abandoned car was found that afternoon in a parking area of Seminary South Shopping Center. The next day, the only major lead in the case developed when a handwritten note was received stating the three had gone to Houston. Police weren't sure if the note had been written freely. 
It has since been sent to the FBI lab in Washington for analysis. No, supposedly written by Rachel said the girls needed to get away and went to Houston, but for the families, it just didn't fit. I don't think my sister wrote that note. Copies of that note, the envelope, and everything else now sit in this room waiting for an answer. The 10 cent stamp on the envelope had been canceled that morning. And that basically means that there was a postmark over the stamp so the stamp couldn't be used again. And this postmark would usually show the date as well as a zip code of the area from which it was sent. But the last few digits of the zip code happened to be blurred almost purposely as if somebody had purposely tried to make those last two digits not decipherable. But based on what they could see, the police felt that the letter could have been sent from Throckmorton, which is about 125 miles east of Fort Worth, or Weatherford, which is about 30 miles east of Fort Worth. After receiving the letter, Tommy Trelisa announced that he was hopeful his wife would be back soon. But Rachel's parents They didn't believe that she'd written the letter. And even the police said they couldn't be sure whether she had or not or whether she'd written it of her own free will. For instance, the L at the end of Rachel's name, it had originally been written with a short loop to the point where it looked more like an E than an L. And someone had gone back over it to make the loop longer and taller to make that letter look more like an L. And people would argue, well, if you're used to signing your own name, how could you make a mistake like that? And of course, there were so many questions questions, so many things that didn't make sense. Why would Rachel have written her name on the outside of the envelope? Why was her name on the outside of the envelope written in pencil, but inside it was written in ballpoint pen? Why had she addressed it so formally when she always called her husband Tommy, not Thomas? Why was the letter the only piece of mail in the mailbox? There was no junk mail. There was no Christmas cards. There was nothing. It was as if the letter had been placed there instead of mailed there, right? Like somebody had hand-delivered it to the mailbox instead of letting it go through the U.S. Postal Service. And it was Christmas Eve, which is notoriously a busy time for the post office. How had the letter been sent the previous night after the girls had, you know, gone missing and made it into Tommy's mailbox first thing the next morning? If the girls wanted to escape to Houston for a week, why had they left the car behind? Uh, Why had Renee left behind her new pair of jeans that she just bought if she knew that she was going to be gone for a week? And if they were looking for a fun and carefree time away from their parents and away from Rachel's husband, why would Rachel and Renee have brought along nine-year-old Julie? No one believed that A, Julie herself would be on board with a plan that had her away from her home and her parents on Christmas, and B, Rachel or Renee, or both of them, would have thought it was okay to basically steal a nine-year-old girl and keep her away from her home and her parents on Christmas. Law enforcement believed that the letter, allegedly written by Rachel, did match a sample of Rachel's handwriting, but once again, they admitted that it was impossible to determine whether or not she had penned it under duress. And maybe that was why she'd addressed her husband in such an odd way, like an oddly formal way. Maybe she was hoping that calling him Thomas instead of Tommy would be so out of character that he would realize something was wrong and that she was writing this letter because somebody was forcing her to. And we'll talk about this in depth a little bit more later on, but I will say there have been several handwriting experts who've analyzed this letter as well as the FBI. And, you know, most of the time with the FBI, it's come back inconclusive as to whether or not Rachel did write this letter based on her handwriting samples. And some experts believe she did. Some experts believe she didn't. But what I will say is somebody who didn't know her would have had a hard time making the handwriting that close to Rachel's to the point where it's inconclusive when analyzed by the FBI, right? Somebody who didn't know her, who didn't have access to something she'd written, wouldn't have been able to make the handwriting sample that close. So if Rachel didn't write this letter and someone else wrote it, in my opinion, it was someone who knew her very well and who had access to things she had handwritten before. By the end of December 1974, the girls had not returned from Houston, and no one had heard from them in nine days. These girls have been missing now for nine days. What are your feelings at this point? There's something that's happened to them. I know it. It's just not like them. They wouldn't have just run off. Nobody heard nothing from them. Well, nine days ago, I thought maybe they had just went somewhere, but now I don't believe they have. I believe they've been picked up by somebody and being held, and that they've been hurt or something. 
You haven't given up hope, though. No, huh? No hope give up. Just want them to come on back home. The papers reported that the family members of the missing girls were despondent and at their wits' end. And it was also reported that the police were continuing to follow leads, but the quality of these leads was questionable, and none of them brought any clarity to the situation. On December 31st, several pieces of women's underwear were found in a field six miles west of Justin, Texas, near a stream. A hunter stumbled upon this discovery, and he told police that he knew the underwear had not been in that spot on Christmas Day because he'd been out hunting then and he hadn't seen them. Police were hopeful that these items might be connected to the three missing girls, but after showing them to the parents, the underwear, uh, the detectives decided that these items had probably just washed down from a nearby garbage dump when the stream had overflowed and had not belonged to any of the missing girls. Some of our friends called us this morning and asked me if we'd heard about it on the news, and I told them no. So then we called down here and they told us we could come look at them. What happened when you looked at the clothing? They're not Renee's. They're not Julie's, I know. And Renee didn't have anything like that, and they're bigger. And Renee didn't have anything that color of green, like the panties were. On January 1st, a man who had known Rachel called her father and reported that he'd seen all three girls at the mall on December 23rd, shortly before they disappeared. This man claimed that he'd been in the record department of a department store in the mall when he'd seen them, and he briefly had talked to Rachel. He said that he noticed there was another person who appeared to be with Rachel, Renee, and Julie, but the newspaper article that gives this information had no further detail about who this person was, whether this person was a male or a female, what this person looked like, or why this man believed the person was with Rachel and the other two girls. So you know what I mean when I say that? Like, why do you think that this other person in the vicinity is with these girls? Is this person talking to them? Is he interacting with them? Is he standing next to them and sort of being involved in your conversation as you talk to them? Or was he just looking at records like in the same aisle? Was he standing near them but not necessarily making contact with them? Was it more like he was following them and watching them? Or was it more like he was with them and they knew that he was with them. Little details like this, that really adds context and helps to flesh out this eyewitness sighting, but we don't really have access to those details. At this point, the Fort Worth Police Department was running into dead end after dead end. And on January 3rd, the Fort Worth Telegram quoted a detective as saying, quote, I wish we had just one clue, one clue to get us off that parking lot, end quote. The article explained that every lead the police followed brought them back to the parking lot behind Sears. And although law enforcement claimed they had no evidence to indicate the girls had been physically harmed, they did admit that they also had no evidence to indicate that the girls were safe. Yetter Benton with the Fort Worth Police Juvenile Division also said, quote, no one seems to really believe they went to Houston, end quote. You think? <laughs> you think they didn't go to Houston? <laughs> I mean, I thought that was obvious. I thought it was obvious that that letter was just like a red herring, but I guess not. It needed to be said out loud. Another juvenile officer, Billy Wilbanks, said that he believed the girls were still in Fort Worth, and he acknowledged and understood that as time passed, the situation obviously looked worse. But he said the time to start worrying wasn't at this moment. It was when they were no longer receiving any new leads, when they no longer had any different places to look or different paths to follow, which is valid, right? I completely agree. If you've still got leads to pursue, if you're still getting a lot of good tips, then yeah, let's not worry just yet at this point. Let's not panic. But in this same article, <laughs> this dude's coworker, Yetter Benton, literally says, quote, we just can't get any farther than that parking lot, end quote, which seems like another way of saying that there really weren't any leads coming in, not anything substantial at least, not anything that led them away from the last place that the girls were known to be, which is giving you no new information because you know where the car is, so you know that they must have been there at that point. And all you need to know now is where they went afterwards, but you aren't getting any leads that brings you there. So I guess it is a time to panic if you're not getting anything that's bringing you away from the last known place of these three victims. So I mean, personally, what I'm hearing from these police officers at this point in time, which is, you know, about a week, week and a half after these girls have been missing, 
I mean, hearing that they're frustrated, they don't know anything, they don't really know what to do next, and they were hoping something came in that, that led them to some better and more valuable information, but nothing really was. And once again, this was bringing them to a level of frustration to the point where I think it was Yetter Benton and one more guy in this article continued saying, like, we just can't get, get off this parking lot. We just can't get off this parking lot. And that stood out to me. Because I've never really heard police express such frustration so early on about a case like this. Usually they play their cards a little bit closer to their chest. So to me, it's an indication that this was actually frustrating to them. And this frustrated the family members that the police weren't getting anywhere. They were mad that the police had initially thought the girls were runaways. They were mad that the police didn't seem to be doing their jobs and they couldn't get a good lead to save their lives. So this led the family members of the missing girls to seek out the advice of a psychic because that's going to be more productive. But anyways, this psychic was uh, recommended to the families by a Houston businessman. And in the newspaper articles, he's identified only as J. Joseph. And he was supposed to be legit. You know, like people believed that he knew what he was doing and he actually produced reliable information, which I guess if you're not getting that from the police and they don't know what to do and they're verbally and outwardly expressing their frustration that they've hit wall after wall, why not? Why not go to a psychic at that point? You know, what else are you going to do? Just sit there and be powerless and wait for nothing to happen? But Renee's mother, Judy Wilson, she claimed that this psychic, J. Joseph, had told them things about Renee that she wouldn't have expected him to know, such as the fact that Renee had been wearing red and white tennis shoes when she'd gone missing, a detail that had not been published in the papers. J. Joseph also asked Tommy Trelisa if the number 150 meant anything to him. And Tommy told the psychic that, you know, he could be referring to the amount of bonds that were missing from the glove compartment of the car that Rachel was driving. Remember, he said three $50 bonds, savings bonds, were missing. Now, this may seem like, oh, what? He knew that? J. Joseph knew about the bonds? No, I don't necessarily think that he did. The $150 worth of bonds missing from the car was printed in one of the early news stories. I saw it myself when I was going through newspapers.com, so it's very likely that J. Joseph could have picked that up from the paper. However, Joseph claimed that he felt there was something wrong with the letter that Tommy had received, and he also claimed that he could visualize the girls in an area where there was a lake and some horses, and he believed that they'd been brought north, possibly towards Grapevine, Oklahoma. Joseph said that he believed the girls were being held against their will by three to five people and that drugs were involved. And then he gave the parents and Tommy an ominous message before leaving. He told them that if they didn't hear from him again, they would know all three girls were dead. And they never did hear from or see J. Joseph again. Now, later, Judy Wilson would tell the papers, quote, I'm not ready to say I believe what he says, but after so many days, I'm not ready to disbelieve either. I believe the girls are hurt and can't get home or that they are dead. I know she wouldn't stay this long unless she was forced, end quote. And obviously, Judy Wilson is referring to her daughter, 14-year-old Renee. On January 8th, 1975, a friend of Richard Wilson's, who was Renee's father, So one of Richard Wilson's friends received a phone call at around 6 p.m. from a girl. And this girl claimed that she was a friend of Renee's. And she said that Renee and the other girls would be arriving home that night on the 7.25 p.m. Greyhound bus from Houston. So obviously the family members of the missing girls gathered together and they rushed to the bus station to meet the 7.25. But when that bus arrived, the girls were not on it. They were all incredibly disappointed and crushed, but Judy Wilson, Renee's mother, said that she hadn't really believed that the caller was a friend of her daughter's. This girl had given her name, but none of Renee's friends knew her, they didn't recognize her name, and Judy couldn't find the name in the Southwest High School directory where Renee was in the ninth grade. Most of the family members left the bus station dejected and depressed at 8.30 p.m., but Tommy Trelisa and Richard Wilson remained for another several hours, holding on to the smallest shred of hope that maybe the girls had missed the earlier bus and they would be on the bus arriving at midnight. Obviously, it goes without saying that they were not on that bus because we wouldn't be talking about them right now if they were. But Rachel's mother said the whole time they were at the bus station, she had a feeling that someone was standing over in a corner somewhere laughing. And when Renee's parents got home, they discovered that someone had burglarized their house while they'd been gone. 
And this is really important. So once again, if you're somebody who keeps notes while we go through these cases, whether physical or mental, I mean, for me, it has to be physical because my mental notepad has long ago been uh, burned to a crisp. But if you're keeping any sort of notes, this is something that I think is important to remember, that these fake phone calls are coming in. And there was a lot of them. We can't even talk about all of them. But the parents of Renee and Rachel and Julie were getting all of these calls from people either pretending to know what happened or pretending to know the girls or pretending to have information about the girls or pretending to be the girls. It's very strange because you do see this happen in cases like this sometimes, especially in like the 70s and the 80s when you couldn't track calls the way we can today. You know, we use cell phones now. So every time you call somebody's cell phone, there is a way to track it and to trace it. So you usually do see this in some of these cases. The Springfield 3 is a case that we did see it in as well. Um, If you have not seen that case or if you don't know about that case, Derek and I covered it extensively on Crime Weekly, and I'll link it in the description box. But what I've never seen before is the amount of hoax and prank calls. I hate calling them prank calls because that seems something like, oh, you do it a sleepover and you're messing around and you're giggling under the blankets with a flashlight and making calls to boys and hanging up on the answer. Like, no, this shit is malicious. I don't understand how people could do this to the loved ones of missing persons. I just don't get it. But either way, I think it's important to note that they got basically lured out of their homes to go to the bus station. Nothing happened. Nobody came on the bus at the bus station. But when Renee's parents get home, they found out that their house had been broken into. By the end of January, posters and flyers had been distributed and affixed to the windows of gas stations, bowling alleys, pool halls, bars, and grocery stores, announcing a $2,000 reward for information that might lead to the recovery of Rachel, Renee, and Julie. Now, by this time, the police began to agree with the parents, who had been saying the whole time that their daughters had not run away. And the police were like, well, yeah, it doesn't really make sense. Like, why would they take a nine-year-old? And there's nothing in their backgrounds to suggest that they would run away. Like, none of them have run away before. There doesn't seem to be any issues that they'd be running away from. So, yeah, we're on board now, finally, at the end of January, a full month since they've been missing. But what do you want? What do you want? Nobody's perfect. On February 7th, Julie's mother, Rayanne Mosley, received a phone call around 11 a.m. And when she first answered the phone and said hello, she heard nothing. And she said that, you know, she kept saying hello, 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 and she heard nothing. And she kind of said hello into the phone without hearing anything back far longer than she would have normally. But because her daughter was missing, she stayed on the phone and kept trying to see if anybody was there. And then she went to go hang up. But right before she hung up, Rayanne said she heard a low moan and then a little girl's voice say, Mama. And Rayanne said that she would be willing to swear the voice she heard on that phone belonged to her nine-year-old daughter, Julie. Rayanne demanded to know who was on the phone, and she asked, is this Julie Mosley? To which the caller responded, yes. She asked where the girl was calling from, but the girl said she didn't know. Now, the call would get disconnected moments after this exchange. It was a very short conversation, but right before the line went dead, the girl who Rayanne Mosley believed was Julie said the word mama once more, And she tried to say something else, but the phone was hung up. Rayanne said that this girl, who she thought was Julie, had sounded off. She wasn't speaking normally. It sounded as if she was drugged. And Rayanne said, quote, I know there's a possibility someone is putting me on, but I'm positive it was Julie on the phone. At least I know she's alive and that helps. But where is she? End quote. So keep this in mind. Julie's mother was positive. Positive. She said she'd swear her life on it that it was Julie on the phone, even though this girl didn't say much, even though she seemed out of it and drugged and her voice wasn't her normal voice, Rayanne Mosley swears it was Julie. Does that mean it was Julie? No. But I think it is very important to realize that this girl's mother believed 100% it was her. So there's a more of a chance that it was Julie. However, I do also think that sometimes When you're in a situation like this, like Julie's mother, you don't know where your child is, you have no closure, you have no hope left, you'll sort of grab onto anything to sustain that hope or bring hope back to you. You know, anything that gives you motivation and energy to like keep going forward and knowing that her daughter was still alive or thinking that she knew her daughter was still alive seemed to give Rayanne Mosley 
exactly that, the motivation to keep going. And sometimes, a lot of the times, every time actually, the parents of missing children need something, something to continue fighting and to continue looking another day. And oftentimes when we're talking about these missing person cases, we see um, parents sort of, and family members in general, and you're going to see it later with many family members in this case, you'll see family members of missing people just follow the craziest leads. And as a person who's not attached to the situation or to the person missing, you might say, oh, why are they even you know, following this lead? It doesn't even seem like it would pan out. It's so loose. It doesn't really make any sense. Because at that point, anything, they anything to keep going, anything to keep following, you have to get up and you have to find something to do with yourself that day that makes you feel like you're being productive towards the task of finding your child, your loved one. And so they'll follow any lead. And it's just very, very sad. So was this Julie on the phone? We don't know. But we do know that just two days later, another one of these calls, hoax calls, was placed to Renee's parents. And they actually traced this call to North Richmond Hills. The police ended up tracing it because, like I said, the parents were getting so many of these calls. At one point, the police were like, "Okay, we're going to have to, like, set up, you know, a team in each of your houses so that when this call comes in, we can actually trace it and, and figure out where the person's coming from. So anyways, this call to Renee's parents was traced to North Richmond Hills, where they found a 14-year-old girl on the other end of the line, a 14-year-old girl who was not Renee Wilson. A Fort Worth police officer told the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, quote, she admitted making three calls to the Wilsons, where she didn't say anything, and one to the Mosley family, where she told Julie's older brother that she was Renee Wilson, end quote. However, this girl denied making that call to Julie's mother, the one that Julie's mother, Rayanne, claims was Julie, without a shadow of a doubt. At the police station, Judy, Renee's mother, spoke to the 14-year-old girl briefly, and then she said, quote, she probably had no motive at all in doing it. When she made the calls, I don't think she knew the frustration she was causing us, but after Mr. Hungerford got through talking to her, I think she understood, end quote. Mr. Hungerford was the police officer who'd handled the situation with the 14-year-old, like, hoax caller, and reportedly, he'd made it clear to this girl that she should not be be making harassing phone calls to parents who were worried sick about their daughters. And then he sent her home with a pair of very angry parents, her own. Personally, I'd like to know what this girl's name was so I can look her up and see what kind of tiny little sociopath she turned into because I don't see how anyone could believe that making these kinds of calls wouldn't be completely traumatic for the parents of the missing girls. Like, I don't care if you're 14 or 40, you know better. Okay, so what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? I just want to know her name. I'm not going to like reveal it. I'm not going to tell you. I just want to know it because I guarantee you. We got a Michelle Carter on our hands with that girl. Remember Michelle Carter and Conrad Roy? This girl was like exactly the epitome of what Michelle Carter would have been in 1975. Really just disappointing that people would do that, that anybody would do that. And I don't care that she was a kid. All right, don't come for me. I don't care that she was a kid. Does she have a brain? Then she knew better. Okay? She knew better. By March of 1975, it came to the attention of Fran Arnold, who was Rachel's mother, that an elderly woman who'd been shopping at the mall on December 23rd, 1974, may have witnessed the abduction of the three girls. She claims she witnessed something. Reportedly, this elderly woman said that she saw a yellow pickup truck with lights on the top of it. And there were two girls and one man inside the truck. And then she also saw another man forcing another girl into that same truck, which makes three girls, two men all day. Three separate employees at the mall had told Fran that this woman had discussed what she'd seen with them, but they didn't know who this woman was. You know, they had only seen her that once and this woman had talked to them about it. So Fran Arnold went on record in the papers asking for the witness to step forward and tell them what she knew, promising to keep her identity a secret if that's what she wanted, but no one ever did come forward. But once again, this is another important thing to make a note of if you're doing so, yellow truck lights on top. In the spring of 1975, the families hired a private investigator named John Swaim. And John Swaim owned a company called Special Services. And listen, <laughs> there's some strange and sketchy stuff surrounding this guy as well, okay? Um, everyone who, who gets involved in this case seems to have some 
weird ulterior motives or they cause some trouble or they just do like odd things that don't make any sense. And John Swaim has been described as being kind of flamboyant, like he knew what to say and how to act to get attention. He knew how to put on a show. He kind of knew how to be all blustery and it doesn't really seem like he actually got anything accomplished or anything done, however, although we wouldn't know for sure for a reason I'm going to tell you in a minute. But when John Swaim came on the case, he immediately, <laughs> immediately made a splash by gathering everyone together for a press conference in March of 1975 so he could publicly call the Fort Worth Police Department out for their handling of the case, basically so he could just get up and have everyone around him with microphones and cameras and say, the Fort Worth Police Department sucks. And he basically said they sucked because they refused to open their police file on the three missing girls to him. They wouldn't show him uh, their files. And Swaim announced that he believed the key to the case could be found in those files on a recorded call to the police dispatcher the night of the disappearances. Swaim said, quote, we have received information that there is a license number and description of a vehicle. This is why we're interested in these tape recordings. Our sources tell us these have been destroyed since, end quote. So the chief of police responded to this allegation and he was like, I don't know what you're talking about with a call. We have no knowledge of such a call. But yes, the dispatcher's tapes do get erased every 60 days so that they can be reused. And you, John Swaim, would know that because we talked yesterday and I told you this exact same shit yesterday. And now you're like up here in front of everybody acting like you ain't ever heard it before. The chief of police also said in regards to showing their file to Swaim, quote, he wants everything we've got. I don't see where we're obligated to turn over everything. We don't open our files up to anybody. It's against all sorts of rules and laws. That's our policy, end quote. And that early on, honestly, I understand that they didn't want to open up their police files to this PI because the PI doesn't have to follow the same rules and laws that the police officers do. And, I mean, what are we in? March of 1975, so it's been about three months since the girls went missing. Definitely not long enough where the police should start opening their files to random people and civilians at that point. But I will say to the police's credit, they actually contacted John Swaim that night and they brought him in. And I guess they kind of worked together and came to some agreement because the very next day, the Fort Worth Star-Telegram printed that John Swaim was now praising the Fort Worth police for their cooperation. And he said, oh, listen, they contacted me and they verbally briefed me on the file and I couldn't ask for better cooperation and everything's amazing and everything's gravy. So kind of like a big, you know, 180 there. In April, John Swaim claimed that he'd received information from an unnamed source that the three girls had been killed and their bodies had been left beneath a bridge somewhere near Port Lavaca. And so the PI arranged for hundreds of volunteers to get together on a Sunday and search under the bridges. The police department in Port Lavaca, which is over 300 miles away from Fort Worth, by the way, they said, listen, we've already looked. We received similar information back in February. We searched under the bridges. But Swaim said they should do it again because he claimed the water under the bridges in February had been two to three feet deeper than they would be now in April. So that would have made extensive searches very difficult. But in April, the water level should be lower so the volunteers could actually see more. And, you know, maybe if the bodies were underwater and nobody was, like, going in the water, they'd be able to see now if there were remains under the bridges. The search began at 9 a.m. And by 3 p.m., Swaim had called it off after hundreds of his volunteers found nothing connected to the three girls under bridges along Highway 35. And after the search was completed, Swaim once again quickly changed his tune and announced that he now believed the girls had run away. And this is pretty much the way it goes with John Swaim. He gets information from an unidentified source. He makes a lot of noise about the information. And then the information leads to nothing. So he backs off for a month or so before popping back up with another lead that leads nowhere, pun intended, until 1979 when John Swaim was found dead due to a drug and alcohol overdose and his death was ruled as a suicide. When Judy Wilson, Renee's mother, contacted Swaim's family to see about getting some pictures returned that she had let Swaim borrow for his investigation, she learned 
that the PI's last request was for all of his files to be burned. And that included all the work he had done on the Fort Worth Trio missing persons case for three years. Three years worth of interviews with witnesses, interviews with friends, his investigation, leads, all of that burned. So as I had said earlier, we don't really know what he accomplished. We don't really know if he made any leeway. We don't know if he got anywhere. Now, was this specifically to burn those files? It could be. There, there could be something in those files that Swaim didn't want anybody to see. But because he had all of his files burned, not just the Fort Worth Trio files, it's also possible that there was something in one of those other files that he didn't want to get out. You know, maybe he had dirt on somebody. Maybe he had information that was dangerous. And he didn't want to leave his wife behind when he died to be kind of targeted by these people that he had information on, information that would be made public after his death. However, I read in some Reddit threads that part of the reason Reason it's believed John Swaim took his own life was because he was going through a rough divorce. But then I found an obituary for John Swaim's wife, and it looked like she died the year before him. So that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Maybe he took his own life because he was sad living without her, but it doesn't look like they were going through a divorce. And it also doesn't look like he would be concerned for her safety or her welfare if he died and left behind files that implicated some people that he was afraid of. There wasn't a lot of information to be found on John Swaim, his personal life, who he was. I did look extensively because I thought there'd be something out there because I wanted to know, is this death suspicious? Or was this person going through a lot? Was he struggling with drug and alcohol addiction for a long time? Was he you know, experiencing something that made him feel despondent, depressed? Did he have a history of mental health issues, things like that? Or was his death made to look like an overdose? And it was just a coincidence that he had made a last request to have all of his files burned. I don't know. Let me know what you think in the comments. Now, back in February of 1975, the month after the three girls went missing, Rachel's husband, Tommy Trelisa, had added $1,000 of his personal money to the reward fund, but he removed the money from the reward fund. And in April of 1976, he filed for divorce from Rachel, citing abandonment. And you may think that Three months is not really a long time to divorce someone who still might come home, right? Who you're still looking for. But Tommy did have a track record with relationships, a specific pattern, you might say. In August of 1971, so three years before Rachel went missing, Tommy had married a woman named Shauna Ford, and together they'd had one son, Sean, who was two years old in 1974. In April of 1974, Tommy filed for divorce from Shauna, and 43 days later, he married a 17-year-old Rachel. At some point in the short time between his marriage to Shauna ending and his marriage to Rachel beginning, he was also engaged to a different person. And who was that other person? Rachel's older sister, Deborah. And we are going to talk more about that later. Trust me, because yeah, it's a weird dynamic, especially when you remember that Tommy, Rachel, and Deborah were all living together in the same house when Rachel went missing. It's a weird dynamic. Now, Deborah would later say, like, oh, we weren't really engaged. It wasn't that serious. There's no ill will. We were all friends. We all got along. It did not ever come between me and Rachel, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, Rachel actually met Tommy through Deborah. Now, did Rachel meet Tommy through Deborah, where Deborah was like, oh, hey, I'm done with him? Here's my sister, Rachel, Tommy. Let me introduce you guys, hoping you guys hit it off. Or did Rachel meet Tommy through Deborah when Deborah and Tommy were dating? Because that's a different story, right? It's a different story. But either way, Tommy gets divorced from Rachel in 1976 after she's been missing for a few months. And the following December, he got married again to another 17-year-old named Josephine Beck. And by June of 1978, he had divorced her as well. Less than three months after that, he was married again, this time to a 23-year-old named Ruby Fox. And that marriage would also end before he met his current wife, Linda, who he's reportedly been married to for over 40 years. And that is pretty much where the case went cold. 
literally just a few months after they went missing. And let's be honest, it was pretty cold from the start. I could have sat here for another hour and told you about all the times they got leads from all over the country or they found bones someplace and they brought out the troops to go and investigate each one only to have it lead nowhere. It was literally as if these three girls had just left the mall and disappeared in that parking lot with no sign of where they went or why they left. And as I had mentioned previously in this episode, it's very reminiscent of the Springfield 3 case, which I have linked below if you want to check it out. Uh, We covered it on Crime Weekly. It's odd enough when one person disappears without a trace, but three people vanishing at the same time, that's very bizarre. And it does suggest that there probably was more than one perpetrator involved. Um, And the police, when they would reopen this case in like the 2000, 2001 time, they also said the same thing, that they believed these three girls had left with someone they knew and that there was more than one person involved. And just for the record, I certainly don't believe that Rachel, Renee, and Julie ran away. I don't believe they just decided they were over Fort Worth, over their families and friends and their lives, and they went off on some fun adventure. And right now they're living on some Greek island, running a rundown bed and breakfast and singing songs about love and loss with Pierce Brosnan or sipping wine under the Tuscan sun. This isn't a movie. This isn't a fairy tale. Something happened to those three girls. Something bad, without a doubt, right? Renee was head over heels for her boyfriend, Terry. She was so looking forward to attending that Christmas party with him the night she vanished. And remember, Terry, her boyfriend, this kid, man, I feel so bad for him. He went through the gigs. In one day, in one foul swoop, he lost his girlfriend, Renee, and his little sister, Julie. And I remember an interview with uh, with Terry and Julie's mom, Rayanne Mosley, and she said... It was so bad. Terry was just absolutely devastated. Like, he just didn't know what to be sad about first. He didn't know what to do. He just felt completely powerless. He regretted not going with them to the mall. Of course, you're going to blame yourself. Everybody, I'm sure, in that case blamed themselves. Not that they were to blame, But that is going to be the natural instinct you feel when you think about the ways you could have prevented it or maybe they wouldn't have been alone if I'd gone or, you know, maybe, uh, I don't know. I just can't even imagine being the loved one of a person who goes missing without a trace and never hearing from them again and constantly wondering what happened. And Julie, we have Julie. She was a nine-year-old girl. She was probably so excited for Christmas morning and all the presents that Santa was going to bring. Now, Rachel, Rachel Trelisa is another story. If any of these three girls had a reason to want to run away, to start fresh, far from Fort Worth and their past, it would be Rachel. But I don't see her bringing two unwilling participants along with her. You know, because if that's the case and we think that Rachel ran away, it would mean that she abducted Renee and Julie and made them run away because they had no reason to. And they were, you know, a little bit younger than her. Julie was much younger than her, just nine. So it would definitely mean that she would have been bringing them with her against their will. And I just don't see her doing that. Why wouldn't she just leave by herself? I will say, I think what happened to these three girls does go beyond a random stranger kidnapping. I don't think the letter that Rachel's husband, Tommy, received the day after she vanished was from her. I think it was sent by someone to deter or delay a police investigation. Um, I think it's very interesting, that letter, because it does specifically mention the Sears parking lot. And there's been some, you know, obviously discourse around this letter. What does it mean? What could it be? And some people have said that maybe the letter was written at a different time, like maybe Rachel had sent this letter or given this letter to her husband or left it for him in their house, you know, weeks ago or months ago. And he just sort of pulled it out and then put it in an envelope, which, by the way, the sheet of paper did not match the envelope. It was said that the sheet of paper was much, much smaller than the envelope, which means the paper was probably more like from a notepad, you know, something you would leave like on the counter for someone, like gone out to the grocery store or whatever, not so much like a sheet of paper that you would write and put in an envelope. The envelope was different. You know, it was written in pencil instead of pen. The letter was written in pen, but the signature was weird. It was almost as if Rachel had misspelled her name, as if she had meant to put an E on the end instead of the L, and then she realized her mistake or whoever was writing it realized their mistake and then tried to like go over it. But you could see what happened there. Once again, the fact that so many experts and the FBI 
cannot come up with a conclusive you know, decision on whether or not she wrote it as far as handwriting analysis goes lets me know that it's so close to her handwriting that somebody she knew wrote it if she did not write it. So honestly, I just think that letter was sent to sort of deter or delay a police investigation. The police already thought that she had run away, that the girls had run away. So why not send a letter that just supports that? And it's not going to have the police out there as aggressively looking as hard for these girls if they think that they're runaways. And if you look at kind of the timeline, it did work. If that was the point and the goal of that letter, it worked because the police didn't really start taking it seriously until the following month in January. I also don't think all the prank phone calls that the parents were receiving were completely disconnected, especially the one telling them to go to the bus station only to have the Wilson's home be broken into while they were gone. I would like to know some things. What was taken? Were some of Renee's things taken? Were her clothes taken, her personal items, things that she might want or things that somebody might want to have as a trophy? I would be very interested to know that. But I do not think that it's completely disconnected. And it could be something as simple as, you know, somebody knew how to get these parents out of their house. Somebody knew that if they called and said, hey, your daughter is going to be on the 735 bus, that, that the Wilsons would leave and go to the bus station and they wouldn't be home. So at that point, they're like, oh, we can break into their house. It might have just been done purposely with the motive being robbery. But I would like to know what was taken so I can kind of decide for myself if I believe that it was connected, but just for the point of robbery, or if it was connected and whoever had the girls or whoever knew where the girls were used the bus station as a guise to get these people out of their house so they could go in and look for something or take something specific. Now, when the case was reopened years later, the police claimed you know, they felt the girls had left the mall with someone they knew and that more than one person had been involved. And I agree, not necessarily that they willingly left with somebody they knew. And many of the parents of these girls kind of felt the same way when this new theory came out. And they were like, we know you're saying that you think they left willingly with someone they knew, but it just doesn't feel like our daughters would do that. If they left and they left the vehicle there and they just went off with somebody knowing that they had to be back by a certain time, they would not have done it willingly. And in the 90s, the investigation would take on a whole new energy, a much more aggressive and kind of negative energy when Rachel's little brother, Rusty, who wasn't a little brother anymore because, you know, he's a grown man at that point, he would sort of make it his life's mission to find out what had happened to his sister and the other two girls. And he would also bring a new private investigator into this fold. And this PI would make some shocking allegations, which would end with Rusty being pitted against his older sister, Deborah. Now, I'm not saying that the PI's allegations caused Rusty to be, you know, against his sister, Deborah, or to be suspicious of her. I think he already was suspicious of Deborah for a while. In fact, a lot of the parents of these missing girls were kind of suspicious of Deborah, especially Renee's father, who kind of always felt that she had something to do with it. And if Deborah had something to do with it, then those parents most likely thought that Rachel's husband, Tommy Trelisa, also had something to do with it because we're talking about something that needed to be done by more than one person. I mean, one person could have abducted all three girls, okay? I'm not going to say that that it's impossible, especially if this person knew them and lulled them into a false sense of security and then brought them someplace and that's when they attacked. It could be possible. It's just not, you know, completely feasible in many scenarios, it's more likely that more than one person was involved in what happened to these three girls. And that's where we're going to pick up next time because trust me, there is still plenty more of this story to be told. I want to thank you all for being here. I want to also update you on the Letitia Stauk trial. I have been watching. I've been making notes. I'm formulating more videos so we can go over the trial. But I've also been trying to keep up with the latest news from the trial. And it's all getting very, very heavy. It's all getting very um, whew, sad. And I've been having to take longer and more breaks than usual, which is when I've been working on these videos that I'm putting out now. So I do want to put these videos out so that you guys can follow along with the trial with me. I'm going to be putting them out. It's just going to take me a little bit longer because this case is very um, close to me. Like it is, it, it's, it's affected me. It's always affected me. And finally being here in the trial and kind of seeing the pieces fall into place and 
everything turning out to be way worse than we had even thought and just way more twisted. It's just, um, it's heavy and it's hard. So I want to do it right and I want to do it with feeling and I want to do it with, you know, good faith and intention. So I will put it out this month when I'm ready to put it out. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Like I know you probably want it now. And I know that there's people putting out updates to this case and this trial as they go along. They're on top of it. But I'm I can't do that um, because I think that Gannon deserves really my full attention and my full like, you know, my full attention. Yeah. Anyways, thank you guys so much for being here. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it. Share it if you think it's worth sharing. Subscribe if you haven't already. I don't know. I guess people think that subscribing doesn't matter anymore, but it does matter because I like to see our community grow and I like to see you guys there with me and I like to you know, know that you're going to be notified when I post a new video. So go ahead and do all of those things. Also, don't forget to follow me on social media, Twitter and Instagram. Links are in the description box. The link to the Crime Weekly series on the Springfield 3 is also in the description box along with my coffee company, Criminal Coffee Company, the best damn coffee you've ever had. We now have K-Cups. So many people wanted K-Cups. We have K-Cups. So go check that out. Link is in the description box. Thank you so much for being here. Stay kind, stay beautiful, and stay safe. I'll see you very soon. Bye. So you got to let it go I got blood